Tales from the Rails. Discovering the Stockton and Darlington Railway. The Railway that got the world on track. Hello and welcome to our second Tales from the Rails. My name is Caroline Hardy. And my name is Archie Mackay. I'm an archaeologist and a trustee for the charity for the Friends of the s and I'm also a director of the Stockton and Darlington Railway Company, but that's a tale for another day. And I'm managing editor of South West Durham News, a small independent publisher of four community newspapers, including the Shildon and District Town Crier, produced right here in the cradle of the railways. As usual, we're joined by Cleo the dog, who's just been on Snafari around Hackworth Park, paying homage to Mr Hackworth himself. She's now sleeping and snoring, and we noticed earlier that her snoring sounds a little bit like a steam train, which is just perfect. Our podcast, Tales from the Rails, will be published on the 27th of each month until 2025, when it will be 200 years since the SNDR opened. We might do a few extras too. This week on Tales from the Rails. We'll focus on just what is so important about the Stockton and Darlington Railway. Why all the fuss? And why is the whole country marking its 200th anniversary in 2025, not just the residents of Stockton and Darlington? And as usual, we'll also, in Stars of the SDR, find out more about the pioneering people who worked on the railway. This week will be about Mrs Anderson. We know so little about her that we don't even know her first name, but she was out there helping to keep the railway running from 1827. She's a fitting choice for March because it's International Women's Month. We'll also be letting you know about events that are coming down the line, so fetch your diaries, make a cup of tea, put your feet up and enjoy the ride on the railway that got the world on track. Tales from the Rails. This podcast is brought to you by the Friends of the Stockton and Darlington Railway, a registered charity set up to safeguard and promote the heritage of the railway that got the world on track. You can join us by visiting our website at www.sdr1825.org.uk. So, Caroline, what is so special about the Stockton and Darlington Railway? Isn't it just a local railway for local people living between Stockton and Darlington? Hmm, well, let's get this out of the way first. Uh, Confusing, I know, but it didn't just run between Stockton and Darlington. On the opening day on the 27th of September 1825, it was actually about 25 to 26 miles long and ran from Witten Park Colliery area. That's north of where Phoenix Row is today, although Phoenix Row wasn't there at the time. Down through West Auckland and St Helen Auckland, then through Brusselton, then through New Shildon, then onwards to Darlington, which was actually about the halfway point, past Eaglescliff and Yarm, and terminated at Stockton. It was also designed to have branch lines, so the Darlington branch opened on the opening day, and the Yarm branch a month later, and by 1830, branches had extended its total length to 50 miles. So it's considerably longer than the 12 to 13 miles between Stockton and Darlington. Well, surely that begs the question then as to why it isn't called the Wooden Colliery and Stockton Railway. Well, it was really important that Darlington featured in the name because that's actually where most of the money and the motivation was coming from. Stockton had to feature in the name as well because it was the terminus and it helped to keep Stockton businesses and merchants on board, so to speak. And if you'd stuck any more places in the title, the name would have been as long as the railway itself. It's important to note that while there were only a few cities in England, there were none in this area. Um, So we couldn't have an intercity railway. It did, however, link the substantial towns of Darlington, Stockton and Yarm and smaller settlements such as West Auckland. It also created the world's first railway town of New Shildon from 1825 and the world's first planned railway town of Middlesbrough from 1830. Okay, so it's about 26 miles long. I suppose that's pretty long for the time, but surely there were railways before. Yeah, you're right. The Stockton and Darlington Railway wasn't the first railway. As a method of transportation, carts and even steam engines had moved along rails before then. Indeed, the method of using rails was probably first introduced into this country by German miners in the 16th century, invited over by Elizabeth I, actually. But the S&DR brought together a number of different technological innovations because the need, the money and the right people were all available at the right time. It was an example of right time, right place. 
So how was the Stockton and Darlington Railway different? Well, it wasn't a temporary private railway like those built for colliery owners. It was designed from the outset to be long distance, a permanent piece of transport infrastructure with a main line and branch lines and anybody, anybody could use it for a fee. So just like today's railways then? Yeah, which is why one of the many reasons we say the Stockton and Darlington Railway is the sort of developmental milestone that creates the modern railway network that we know today. Such a large-scale permanent piece of infrastructure required an Act of Parliament and after a few failures and delays caused by landowners objecting to it and one king dying, the first Act was obtained in 1821. This really began to set out the manifesto for what would become the business model for our national railway network. It set out the sort of things the railway could carry. Here's a list from the Act of Parliament for you to read, Archie. Thanks, Caroline. Limestone, road repair materials, manure, coal, coke, coal, cinders, stone, marl, sand, lime, clay, ironstone and other minerals, building stone, pitching and paving stone, bricks, tiles, slates and all gross and unmanufactured articles and building materials, lead in pigs or sheets, bar iron, wagon tyre, timber, staves and deals and all other goods, commodities, wares and merchandises and finally coal. So that just about covers everything. But it doesn't mention passengers though. Well, this was added in the second Act of Parliament, and that was obtained two years before the railway opened. Quite a few books and social media postings suggest that passengers were an afterthought, but they weren't really because they were designed in before the railway opened, in fact, two years before the railway opened. So with the SNDR, we see the start of our modern rail service designed to carry a mixture of goods and merchandise and passengers, a long-distance permanent transport facility available for all to use at an advertised rate and timetable. And that was the start of our modern railway. And over the next five years, the SNDR was pioneering. It led the way in the provision of rail travel, learning the hard way how to run a railway. That first act was for a horse-drawn railway though, wasn't it? That's not very modern, is it? Uh, Well, you're right again. The 1821 Act of Parliament was only for a horse-powered railway. But thanks to the far-sightedness of Darlington's Edward Pease, one of the main promoters and financiers of the Stockton and Darlington Railway, and the engineering genius of George Stevenson, the railway was redesigned. And that new Act of Parliament obtained in 1823, which introduced passengers, also made it steam-powered. And the decision to switch from horse to steam was made on the very day that that 1821 Act of Parliament was obtained, Now, just think about that for a minute. That 1821 Act of Parliament took years to get because of people objecting. And on the day that they get it, they make a decision to go locomotive-powered and redesign the railway, which means they're not quite back at square one, but they're not far off it because they've now got to redesign it and get another Act of Parliament. That's an astonishingly far-sighted and brave decision. George Stevenson was employed to set out this alternative route and to do so he worked with local surveyor John Dixon and George's 18-year-old son Robert. The main alterations were to the hilly west end of the line and anywhere with a tight bend or too many alterations in level. The use of stationary steam engines to haul wagons up and down the hilly terrain reduced the length of the line considerably and that also reduced the cost. And from Shildon eastwards, the entire route could be hauled by what was called a superior travelling locomotive engine without too many alterations. In fact, Stevenson said it was as beautiful a line as could have been chosen. OK, so you're going to use steam engines to run the railway. Where do you then get them from? Who made them for the s This was a problem. The technology for commercially produced steam engines had been improving throughout the 18th and early 19th centuries thanks to the likes of Thomas Newcomen, James Watt and Richard Trevivick. These were just some of the engineering giants that made the development of the S&DR possible. Most steam engines being used prior to 1825 were stationary and they'd be used for things like pumping water from mines. Uh, But from the late 18th century, steam engines were also powering some factories and mills. Importantly, though, collieries were using them as locomotives to carry coal from the mine, and it was in that capacity that the likes of Timothy Hackworth and George Stevenson became engineering experts. But locomotive manufacturers were few and far between, 
And they wouldn't be used to making superior locomotive engines that would work as continuously and as hard over long distances in all weathers as they would need to on the S&DR. Nor would they necessarily be able to churn out enough steam engines quickly enough, especially if this idea of a nationwide transport infrastructure provided by locomotive-powered railways took off. So key figures from the SNDR and their business partners made another far-sighted decision to set up Robert Stevenson & Co. in 1823, two years before the railway would open. Robert was now 20. This company would make and supply engines knowing that not only would they need them at the SNDR, and they kicked off by commissioning five locomotives plus two stationary engines, but also that any other railways following them would also need them. If the SNDR was a success, the market for steam-powered locomotives would explode and Robert Stevenson & Co. would be already in production and ready to receive the orders. What a cunning plan. So they had a ready supply of steam engines once Robert Stevenson & Co. opened in 1823. Uh, well, not exactly. Uh, first, Robert Stevenson displaying a total lack of gratitude or breaking free from the oppressive expectations of his father and friends, and take your pick there, he took off to Colombia in South America in 1824 and didn't return until 1827. Now, that's quite another long story. If you want to read more about this escapade, get yourself a copy of a book called Rocket Man with Cousin Jacks by Bob Longridge. Bob is the great, great, great grandson of Michael Longridge, who managed the Bedlington Iron Works and made the malleable iron rails for the SNDR. And he was a co-founder of Robert Stevenson & Co. But this abandonment of his newly formed company left the SNDR in trouble. His father, George, was overstretching himself by now and beginning to offer expert advice to other companies thinking of following the SNDR in creating large-scale railways. Financiers such as Edward Pease were increasingly frustrated because the goods weren't being produced and strong words were exchanged between the SNDR and George Stevenson. Timothy Hackworth was employed as a borrowed man at Robert Stevenson & Co for six months and another engineer, James Kennedy, was also brought into the 4th Street Works to try to progress the locomotives using designs sketched out by George. But George wasn't there to oversee the works and that caused problems. Again, you can read more about this by a report produced uh, just within the last few months by Michael Bailey and Peter Davison. It was commissioned by the National Railway Museum. Uh, uh, he had to carry out research into locomotion number one and carry out an excavation of it. We'll perhaps look at this in a little more detail in the future, but that report can be found in the online library of the Friends website. So it's no great surprise that the relationship with locomotives in the early days was not very successful. And to be honest, a lot of other companies who were thinking about building railways started to think they might be better sticking to horsepower after seeing all the problems on the SNDR. Wheels were breaking on the locomotives regularly. The stationary steam engines on the inclines broke down, causing bottlenecks along the line of wagons waiting to travel along the incline and not being able to. The second locomotive engine to be delivered to the SNDR was called Hope. Didn't work at all. Hopeless, you might say. The SNDR was leading the way by actually running a multi-use railway network, not just thinking about it, but that meant they got to make all the mistakes and learn the hard lessons way before anybody else. Now, this is where Timothy Hackworth came into his own. He'd been appointed in May 1825 as locomotive superintendent for the SNDR, so... He was the person who had to deal with the breakdowns arising on the Stevenson-provided engines and locomotives after opening in September. Necessity is the mother of invention, and so Hackworth made alterations to the stationary engines and got the inclines moving again. He adapted parts from old locomotives to help improve them. He built on ideas, some of them from other people. He created his own. Soon he devised wheels that didn't break excessively and which went on to be used on locomotives for decades afterwards. He was pretty sick of repairing dodgy locomotives and he ended up building a new locomotive called the Royal George in 1827. And this one worked. And it was reliable. Its successful use restored confidence in the locomotive and other railways went on to adopt the locomotive as the cheapest, fastest, most efficient method of transportation on a railway. So the influence of the lessons learned at the SNDR spread far and wide. And with all this locomotive trouble... Horses had been used to fill the gaps. By 1828, the SNDR committee were keen to ensure that horses were never used on the line for freight and imposed fines for doing so. 
So, in actual fact, the SNDR was designed to be steam-powered from the start. It's just that there weren't enough reliable locos being built to allow them to be wholly powered by steam from day one. Well, most of us are familiar with using the railways as passengers nowadays, Caroline. So how did the passenger provision go? Well, the SDR developed regular passenger traffic. It was timetabled with lists of advertised fees. There were luggage allowances and differential rates for different seats, plus rules of behaviour for travelling. The passenger traffic flourished beyond initial expectations and by early 1826 to 7, it was carrying some 30,000 passengers a year. That was more than an eightfold increase in local pre-railway travel. Soon after the railway opened, SNDR staff had to use the railway themselves to commute between their varied and largely undefined jobs in a profession that was only just unfolding. With regular meetings to attend to in Darlington every Friday and running a railway 26 miles long, railway staff were constantly travelling by train along the line. But importantly, it wasn't just railway staff who were commuting by rail. In 1821, Archibald Knox stated that he travelled along the railway two or three times a week from Highington, and Robert Crowther testified that his business often took him to Stockton or Darlington from Highington, and they always travelled by railway, which is a great convenience to the public, he said. So, commuting by rail started here? Yep. We've got evidence of commuting by train, by the public, actually from 1827, but passenger traffic was the last haulage to make the transition to locomotive. Specially adapted coaches for passengers were hauled by horse initially and the contracts to run the passenger trains were contracted out to private businesses, mostly inns, within a month of operating. So much like today's railway then, with network rail owning the track and private businesses running the service using their own rolling stock. Yes, although I should point out the S&R abandoned that method of running the passenger service as long ago as 1833 and took it back in-house. Sometimes I think we should do the same with our own railway. The S&R started to move the passenger traffic towards locomotive power in 1829 when the S&R committee asked Timothy Hackworth, their engineer, to design a nice new locomotive suitable for hauling coaches and wagons for passengers. This was the Globe and was used to open the Middlesbrough branch line in December 1830, hauling adapted wagons full of passengers. Right, so if there was a passenger service, presumably there were also railway stations. Well, when the SNDR started, there actually wasn't any such thing as a railway station. Uh, They hadn't been invented yet. They realised that the public needed shelter and refreshments while they waited on a train. Uh, The only parallel, really, was the stagecoach, which left from inns. So in 1825, they took out a lease on an existing inn on the quayside at Stockton called the Mariner's Tavern. And in 1826, they built three company inns at Highington, Darlington and St John's Crossing at Stockton. These inns also offered accommodation and refreshments. Now, all three inns were slightly different, but the one at Highington is pretty close to being a station. Indeed, it's now actually called the, the world's first railway station. It offered refreshments and shelter in a wayside building with a platform leading to a railway, but also allowed people to use it to collect or drop off packages and parcels to be delivered by train. It was located next to a depot. It served the railway staff and customers using the depot as well. So that sounds like a railway station to me. All three buildings actually survive, and the railway tavern in Darlington is still an inn. It's still got a room layout upstairs pretty much as designed in 1826 and there's an amazing level of survival internally. There's a campaign being run now by the Friends of the S&R to rescue the Highington building, which is derelict, and hopefully if that campaign is successful, once again, passengers will be able to seek refreshments and shelter in the building that's offered the service since 1827 when it opened. The first railway in to be ready in 1825 was actually not built by the SNDR, but by Mr Maynell, who was the chair of the SNDR, a shareholder and the band leader from the opening day. He was a man for an eye for opportunity. He built the new inn, now called the Cleveland Bay, at the terminus of the Yarn Branch. It too is still a pub. Other taverns went on to be built alongside the line and next to depots, with the express purpose of providing railway users with shelter, refreshments and a place to manage parcels and packages, such as the station at Fighting Cox, built by the S&DR in 1830. So, if you want to support your railway heritage, have a drink at the new inn at Eaglescliff or the railway tavern in Darlington. 
Exactly. And at Highington, if we manage to rescue the building and bring it back into use, maybe in 2027, 200 years after it was built, make sure you visit. And in the short term, donate to our campaign. You can read more about that on the Friends website. The SNDR also built a goods station in 1826-7, and this was located on North Road in Darlington. Here the goods were loaded on and off trains, hoisted down through the building to the waiting carts below and taken away by road. These goods were in transit and already paid for. This building was converted into a passenger station and railway workers housing in 1833 when it was replaced by another goods shed on the opposite side of the road. That first goods shed or goods station was demolished in 1864 but the other 1833 goods station is now the entrance point to the new Hopetown Railway Museum in Darlington, opening in summer 2024, folks. Did they know that the SNDR was going to be the start of something new when they opened the railway? Yeah, I, th- I think so. The, the Acts of Parliament set out their vision, which was wholly new. And in fact, getting an Act of Parliament for uh, such an extensive railway was wholly new as well. Um, the solicitors for the railway company actually had to explain to a clerk in the House of Commons what a locomotive was because everything was so new. Four years before the railway opened, retired wool merchant and Quaker Edward Pease, the main financier and force behind the railway, knew that the railway could become the new King's Highway. And many years later, when he was writing in his diary and he looked back at 1825, he wrote... It's the S&DR's completion in 1825 that may be said to have given birth to all others in this world. Where the Croft branch was formally opened in 1829 at the Croft Spa Hotel by Francis Mewburn, the company's solicitor, he speculated that one day the railway would allow travellers to lunch in Darlington and take an opera in London the same evening. Such a vision was met with smirking over cold collations, but the Croft branch was to have a role in making that national network a reality. And part of it became what remains to this day, the East Coast Main Line. So what impact did the SNDR have on other areas? Well, the interest in what was happening on the SNDR was on a national and international scale, with engineers and promoters from other parts of the UK, from France, America, eagerly monitoring the construction of the line and attending the opening ceremony in 1825. The ideas used by other railways that went on to be adopted included Stevenson's standard gauge track to run the S&DR. That means there's four foot eight and a half inches between the rails and this standard gauge went on to be adopted by most railways in the world. The use of malleable iron rails uh, from Bedlington and uh, locomotive power, they were also widely adopted. And later in 1825, French engineer Marc Sagan and his brother Camille visited the S&DR The brothers went on to be largely responsible for the construction of France's first railway, the saint Etienne to Lyon railway, between 1828 and 1833. In 1826, and again in 1827, two engineers from Prussia, Karl von Oeynhausen and Heinrich von Dechen, made their first visit to Darlington and Schilden to learn more about the railway in order to inform progress back home, where mineral railways had long been established using wooden rails, remember... That's where the um, idea of railways came from in the 16th century in the first place. The account they wrote concentrated on the S&DR because it was the most advanced railway in the world. And they concluded by recommending malleable iron rails as used by the S&DR. And it's clear from the text that they wrote that they saw Darlington as the finest railway in England, followed by Hetton Colliery Railway, also designed by Stevenson and opened in 1822. But that was a colliery railway. In 1828, Robert Stevenson wrote a note to Hackworth asking him to show a French engineer the railways and machinery. And a little closer to home, delegations were visiting from Liverpool. And uh, due to uh, technology of time travel, we can now listen to a letter to Hackworth from Edward Pease. Esteemed friend Hackworth, I'm informed that a deputation is coming from Liverpool to see our way, but more particularly to make inquiry about locomotive power. Have the engines and men as neat and clean as can, and be ready with thy calculations, and only showing the saving, but how much more work they do in a given time. Have no doubt but thou will do thy best, and have all sided and in order in thy department. Thy friend, Edward Pease. Thank you, Edward. So 
New Shilden was quite a cosmopolitan place, full of strangers, all coming to learn how to build and how to run a railway, because that was really the only place that you could do that. The 27th of September, 1825. The day that changed the face of the world. So, Caroline, how much of the SNDR survives today? Can you visit it or ride a train on it? Actually, survival's pretty good. If you get on a train at Shildon, travel past Hangton Station, and get off again at Darlington, you're still running along the line that was opened on the 27th of September 1825, the same route where George Stevenson and his brother Jem drove locomotion number one and where Timothy Hackworth acted as guardsman. And just like in 1825, uh, you don't buy a ticket at the station, you buy one on the train. Incidentally, it's along this stretch that Hitachi is located where some of the world's most advanced rolling stock leaves the plant using Stockton and Darlington Railway. Still in Darlington, but a little further along, uh, the Skern Bridge still exists there, which uh, was part of the 1825 railway. And to this day, trains still travel across the Skern Bridge. And if you continue the journey all the way to Thornaby, on the edge of Stockton, the train will ride along parts of the 1825 route. There are also plenty of surviving bits that no longer have a railway on them, but they do have a footpath, and that footpath is increasing in extent as Durham County Council have got people out negotiating access to those areas that currently don't have it, and they're upgrading existing paths so that by 2025, we hope that much of the 1825 route can be walked and cycled. You can actually use the Friends self-guided walk booklets to navigate your way along the line, and these can be found in our online shop at our website which is www.sdr1825.org.uk. So, the SNDR was the start of the modern railway, a combination of passenger, freight and goods transport, the start of a national permanent transport infrastructure available to anyone to use, a network of main line and branch lines and locomotive powered. What was learned on the SNDR informed other embryonic railways across the world. It enabled huge industrial growth, leading to expanded towns and cities, and ultimately triggered the second phase of the Industrial Revolution. And quite a lot survives. You can still catch a train along parts of the route that was used on the opening day on the 27th of September 1825 and importantly, drinking pubs that were frequented by customers, passengers and staff of the SNDR nearly 200 years ago. Cheers! Cheers. Okay, so now we move on to news and events over the period from March the 27th onwards. So Caroline mentioned uh, footpaths and cycleways just a little bit earlier. Um, More footpath and cycleway has been constructed for the 26-mile SNDR path due to open in 2025. The path has now gone in at Preston Road in Newton Aycliffe and a tarmac surface adjacent to Hackworth Industrial Estate in New Shildon. Work is still going on in Darlington and Stockton to try and achieve the best possible route within the finances available and the time. It's a real shame that the path wasn't funded via levelling up funding in the way that it was in County Durham. A literal case of lack of joined up thinking, I think. But as long as the trail is usable for 2025, even if it doesn't exactly follow the line in places, then we can always seek further improvements in years to come. And it may be, actually, that visitors want to experience the line partly on foot and partly by train. Funding has been obtained at Fighting Cox for an amazing new railway mural to be painted by Durham Spray Paints. The mural will be painted between the 24th and 26th of April and there will be a public event unveiling the completed mural on Saturday the 27th. The local friends of the SNDR are currently out preparing the wall surface ahead of the painting. Born Again Gardens have tidied up the sleeper block area near the Mason's Arms in New Shildon that was set up by the Brusselton Incline Group. The friends of the SNDR have got area groups along the line who care for their patch and lead on projects there and the Brusselton Incline Group, or big as we call it, has in fact been running longer than the friends. 
and the next meeting of BIG will take place on the first Saturday in April, that is Saturday the 6th of April, at 10.15am in the former Whistle Stop Cafe on Redworth Road in New Shildon. And as reported on the front page of last week's Shildon Town Crier, the new hall at Locomotion is now being stocked with various locomotives ready for the opening in May. Once open, this will be the largest undercover display of historic rail vehicles in Europe, which is fantastic news for Shildon. You will also be able to see the ironwork from the Stevenson-designed Gonless Bridge, one of the world's first iron railway bridges. It is going on permanent display beside New Hall. The bridge has been on its travel since 1901, when it was first taken down from the stone abutments and replaced. And those stone abutments are due to have a new bridge decking uh, to go over the Rin- River Gonless. That's been commissioned by Durham County Council. And uh, there should be a public consultation soon on its design. So really, really looking forward to seeing that. So, Hyington, the world's first railway station. We've had a really good coverage across TV and printed news programmes, both in the UK and overseas, with regards to the campaign. We've been contacted by a wide range of people and organisations who would like to support and help us. These include private individuals, business and charity trusts, all inspired by the story of the SNDR and the world's oldest railway station. Peter Gibson MP also raised the case for saving Hyneton Station in the House of Commons on the 12th of March, and Paul Howell, the constituency MP, has been spreading the word too to his colleagues in government. The Hyneton History Day took place on March 9th and between 130 and 160 people attended and about £500 was raised for the campaign to save the station. Dave Reynolds' new book on 190 years of history of the Railway Institute called An Insatiable First was launched on the 10th of February. I'm going to plug his book here because Dave Reynolds is actually the man who wrote the music for this podcast. He's a very talented individual. You can buy his book at the Stute in Shildon or on Amazon. The Stute, as it's affectionately called, was founded by railway pioneer Timothy Hackworth under the influence of the railway pioneering Pease family in 1833. That was therefore the first such society to be created for the educational, moral and social benefit of railway employees. The SNDR Community Fund has agreed to fund the SNDR Music Project For those of you who heard our first podcast on the opening day of the SNDR, you will know that the train was accompanied by music between Darlington and Stockton. This was provided by Mr Maynell's band from Yarm. The band then went on to play at the banquet in Stockton's town hall. Well, the SNDR music project will hire specialist musicians to record these cheering and appropriate airs on authentic instruments from the period. This music will be available as a free download so it can be used at any events. Further, there will be a series of videos by the musicians for schools to use with KS1 to 2 children. Hopefully, we will get a sneaky preview of this music later this year. And the next G5 Open Day at Shildon is on Saturday 6th April and there's one on the first Saturday of every month for the rest of the year. The G5 is located on Hackworth Industrial Park, appropriately, in Shildon, and the postcode for that is DL41HF. And I'm just going to take this opportunity to look for a volunteer or two. The Friends of the SNDR could do with an additional volunteer to help us organise events, and this is getting increasingly important as we get towards 2025. So if you think you can organise guided walks, cheese and wines... Anything with beer. Beer is very important. Um, Do contact us through our website if you can give us some of your time to help us organise some really exciting events over the next year or two. And we'll put links to um, everything that we mentioned in the podcast in the show notes, which you can find at the bottom of the podcast. Um, That'll include all of the events and all of the the links to the websites. Stars of the SNDR. Today we're going to attempt to shine a light on Mrs. Anderson of Spout Lane in New Shildon. 
I've chosen a woman this month who we know remarkably little about, and I'm hoping that by shining the spotlight on her, somebody out there might be able to furnish us with more information. Now, the SNDR didn't formally employ any women until 1833, but many women, like Mrs Anderson, covered for their husbands as well as running the home. Mrs Anderson was the wife of Joseph Anderson, who was engaged in May 1827 to manage the warehouse, keep accounts and generally be useful, great early job description, at Spout Lane between New Shilden and Thickley. This required him to also keep the time of the mechanics at New Shilden and to regularly be at the foot of Brusselton Incline to collect the tickets and he had to monitor the enforcement of bylaws. These duties took him to Stockton, Darlington and Yarm at least twice a week. His job was so vast it was eventually, in 1832, divided between two people. He had no assistance to cover for him so Mrs Anderson covered his duties at the warehouse while he was away. Joseph Anderson left his position with the SNDR in May 1834 and was replaced by John Glass. The 1841 census makes no mention of the Andersons at all near the SNDR. They must have moved away from Thickley and New Shildon by then to pastures new and to a new job perhaps. It's such a common name, Anderson, it's difficult to track them down. One of our members, Maggie Poole, found a Joseph Anderson and his wife Elizabeth living in Wrighton in 1841. They looked to be about the right age, but that person, that particular Joseph Anderson, was a farmer. Could they be our family? Because women are so easily written out of history, we don't even know Mrs Anderson's first name. An unreliable source suggests it was Rebecca, so probably not our Ryhope Andersons then. So... Is there anyone out there who can help? Maybe you're researching the Anderson family tree. She must have been so busy controlling freight traffic coming from the Black Boy branch line onto the main line because Joseph Anderson was away so often, so it would be really super to find out more about her. So that's for another month and we're really looking forward to um, hearing from you if you've got any inclination as to um, who Mrs Anderson might have been. Um, So if you hear anyone saying the SNDR was just a coal wagon way or that passengers were an afterthought or it just ran between Stockton and Darlington, you have our permission to box their ears. Next month we're going to feature the world's earliest railway station, Highington Station at Acliffe Lane and the campaign to save it. Why is it important? What happened there over the last 199 years? And who did it happen to? What needs doing? What might happen if we get enough support? We'll get to know some of the people involved in building it, running it, and even someone who managed to get blown up near it. And we'll also meet some of the people descended from its railway officers. So remember, you can help to prepare for 2025 by joining the Friends of the SNDR at sdr1825.org.uk and if you need help planning your own 2025 events Kate Barrett and the SNDR Heritage and Community Participation Manager is the person to talk to. She's got an SNDR community fund which can provide grants of a few hundred to a few thousand pounds and which are available over the next four years to help people celebrate and conserve the SNDR. If you've got an idea, then get in touch with Kate and she'll provide initial feedback on your idea and see that it fits the community grant objectives and encourage you to submit an application. I'd encourage you to do that as soon as possible because I'm aware that there are about 80 applications in the system already, so things are going to get competitive. The team of various officers in the local authorities, including Nikki Halifax, the 2025 Festival Director, can all now be contacted through one single email address, which is info at sdr200.co.uk, which people should use for any general inquiries. And again, all of these links will be put into um, the footnotes. And if you need help getting your SNDR facts right for your event or for your business advertising, just contact the Friends of the SNDR via their webpage. Thank you.